Welcome to The Optimistic American. Steven Pinker is a professor at Harvard, a cognitive psychologist and an experimental psychologist who conducts experiments in visual cognition and social connections. He's also a popular science author and public intellectual and an advocate of evolutionary psychology and a computation theory of the mind. He has 12 books, including four that we're going to discuss today. Those four are The Blank Slate, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Enlightenment Now, and Rationality. His awards are numerous, including elected member of the National Academy of Sciences, two-time Pulitzer finalist, Humanist of the Year, nine honorary doctorates, foreign policies, world top 100 intellectuals, and Times Top 100 People of the Year. He is the counterculture response to the divisions that threaten us today using rationality and science. Most importantly, in his books, he challenges the status quo. He's fearless in his ability to test the norm. His ability to tell the truth is belied by a keen intellect and data sciences. He is the counter response to the divisions that threaten us today using rationality, logic, and science. Professor Pinker is a great person to have on our show. Professor Pinker, uh, thank you very much for being on our show today. I think you're in uh, Boston, Massachusetts, back at Harvard University today. That's correct. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. So uh, on our show, on The Optimistic American, one of the big things that we focused on uh, is the idea that the, that the public seems to be losing faith, that there's this sense from watching the nightly news, listening to the political parties, what's happening with candidates, uh, there's this very uh, strong negative sense about our country and about what's going on in the world. Unfortunately, I think oftentimes that causes them to lose not only hope, they lose their sense of agency. Uh, and uh, I believe that that's part of why we're beginning to have a problem with identity politics and people moving into their corner. You've written quite a bit about this. In fact, uh, Bill Gates said one of his favorite books ever was Enlightenment Now. It definitely is one of my favorite books ever. But you scoff at the idea of being called an optimist. I'd like to know why that is. Well, the, the argument that I've made in Enlightenment Now and before that in my book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined, is that the um, <clears throat> reality about the historical trends is that many of them have gone in a positive direction and that no one's aware of it because we get our view of the world from the news the news is a highly non-random sample of what happens in the world. It focuses on events, sudden events, which are more likely to be bad than good because it's easy to, just, to destroy something very quickly. Things that get built up tend to get built up a few percentage points a year, which can compound and change the world by, by, by stealth. But uh, since they don't consist of events that happen on some you know, Thursday in, in uh, July, uh, they never make headlines, and so people are unaware of them. The fact, for example, that extreme poverty has declined from 90% of humanity to less than 9%. There's never a particular day that that made for a headline, but it has transformed our world. If we got our news once every 50 years, we'd probably be aware of it because of the change that can occur over a 50-year span. But day to day, uh, it just creeps up by, by, by a lot of the scheme of things, as Max Roser put it, the Papers could have had the headline, 137,000 people escaped from extreme poverty today, every day for the last 30 years. But they never wow. had the headline, so more than a billion people escaped from extreme poverty in the last uh, few decades, and no one's aware of it. So is that optimistic? I don't think it's optimism. It's just being aware of facts of the world that are systematically um, invisible from the source that most of us rely on, namely, namely the news. And this, the same is true for other measures of, of human well-being, such as longevity, which, um, although had a setback in the, uh, the COVID years, has dramatically increased, more than doubled in the last 150 years or so, and continues to, to uh, increase worldwide. Illiteracy, uh, e even rate of death from war, we don't know what's going to happen with the uh, setback from the war in Ukraine. But chances are it's not going to take us back to the death tolls from the uh, 
era of the Iran-Iraq War, the Vietnam War, the Korean War, to say nothing of the world wars. Now, of course, uh, I, I'm not advocating optimism in the sense of, don't worry, everything will turn out okay. There's no reason that everything will turn out okay if we just let things happen. All human progress is the result of humans applying their ingenuity to, to making humanity better off. Uh, but what the data tell us is that when people do set that as their goal, every, every now and again they can succeed. And if we remember the things that, uh, that work and try not to repeat our mistakes, then the result can be progress as a, as a reality, as an empirical fact about history, not just as a mindset to see the glass as half full. All right. So the, uh, the reasons that you think are behind this new enlightenment, what are, what are the causes of it in your mind? Well, the, um, <clears throat> the, the, the change in ideas uh, consists of not, not being fatalistic. That is, our, uh, what happens on, on Earth is not the result of um, a, a divinely unfolding plan. It's not the result of fate. There's a lot, there is a lot of uh, chance and contingency, but it also depends on, on uh, human agency, that what humans do can, can make a difference. Uh, and that uh, we can understand our world better by, uh, by science and, and other means of objectively understanding the world, that keeping records, keeping statistics, journalism, history, we can understand more of the world through the use of science and, and uh, reason that our goal ought to be the um, flourishing of humanity, health, longevity, safety, peace, knowledge, culture, uh, and that when we uh, apply reason and science to the goal of making humanity better off, that first of all defines a moral purpose for all of us, and that it's not romantic or utopian or even necessarily optimistic in the sense of just expecting things to get better. It, uh, but it's optimistic in the sense that history tells us that it can, that it can work. When you look at the data, um, certainly uh, your book spent a lot of time talking about what's going on throughout the world. Um, do you find the same thing happening in the United States or do you see the same set of positive trends happening here as opposed to just uh, outside of the United States? Well, in many ways, the United States is surprisingly an, uh, something of an outlier among affluent democracies, that a lot of the positive trends are, uh, are, are much slower in the United States. We are uh, considering that we're a rich country, that we're more or less a democracy. We uh, lag behind a lot of our peers in, in um, Western Europe and the, uh, the, the Commonwealth of Nations like Canada and New Zealand and Australia. In, um, in just about every measure, we've got a higher crime rate, we've got lower life expectancy, we've got higher child mortality, we've got more drug, drug addiction, more uh, <coughs> obesity. So, I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're better than uh, a typical country in sub-Saharan Africa or in, in uh, Southwest Asia, but um, we're, we're surprisingly behind the curve uh, if you consider the club of affluent democracies. What do you think is the cause of that? Some of it is the um, the uh, probably resistance in the United States to um, having government play a greater role in social uh, organization. We have less investment in uh, at the national level in, in healthcare, in um, uh, educational standards, which are uh, which um, devolve to municipalities, uh, in crime and safety and policing. The, uh, we've got a, uh, an awful lot of subsidiarity, that is we kind of foist it on the local towns and, and, and uh, counties, and they often don't do as, uh, many of them don't do as good a job as uh, the, the, the best practices uh, in the country as a whole. Other European, European and uh, Commonwealth countries tend to have things more um, more nationalized. Also, the United States is so uh, divided. Uh, there's a black-white divide. There is a coastal um, and uh, college town educated uh, elite versus uh, more southern and southwestern uh, populist resistance to anything coming from, from, from the elite. 
uh, that's um, much greater in the United States. Even though it, it's not unique to the United States, but it, uh, it seems to be more pernicious in the United States. One, one historian said that uh, democracy came too early to the United States, that in, the, in, in Europe, the government had, uh, while they were still monarchies, had uh, kind of established law and order, had uh, kind of pacified the uh, unruly countryside, and then the people made the, took over the reins of government and made it more democratic. In the United States, it was more democratic from the get-go. We, we elected judges. There was a lot of, uh, of um, uh, anarchy before the closing of the frontier. And um, the basic infrastructure of safety and education and, and health uh, was not in place um, when the country democratized, but um, people uh, got, got what they wanted, a lot of local autonomy, and probably had to settle for um, less than best practices. Mm -hmm. So um, back to kind of the, the effect that's going on in the world, what are the conditions that you think that have... Um, created this this enlightenment period that's going on throughout the world. Have free markets played into that? Has that uh, uh, is, is that just been the fact that they're industrializing? What are the conditions that are taking place that is really uh, moving the world in a positive direction? At least uh, here recent. Well, affluence certainly is one of them. That um, uh, <clears throat> that the countries that we tend to admire most in terms of their social progress and quality of life, like Scandinavia and uh, Western Europe, they are, they're capitalist countries. They're not um, anarcho-capitalist countries. That is, they have um, pretty extensive government regulation of safety and the environment. They've got a welfare state that looks after the people who can't contribute to the market. But they've got a lot of market freedom and they're, they're not uh, state-controlled. Um, and, and they're rich. Sweden and Norway uh, and Switzerland and, and the Netherlands are, are really rich countries. Now, being rich itself uh, is not enough to have a <clears throat> high quality of life, high social progress, because a lot of the um, uh, Gulf oil extracting states are, are filthy rich and they're, they're pretty miserable places to live. Uh, the it, it, it seems to be important that the source of wealth be commerce, exchange, networks of, of um, uh, economic cooperation rather than digging valuable stuff out of the ground. So, um, so one of the ingredients is a, a market in the sense of people um, cooperating in, in uh, economies, although the world has never had an affluent democracy without extensive regulation and social spending. So the, the, the Kind of libertarian anarchist utopia of an affluent democracy with no social safety net and no no regulation to, uh, has never existed. Maybe it could exist, but history provides no examples. And as countries get richer, they tend to get more uh, redistributive. It's a, something called Wagner's law. As countries like Brazil and India um, become more affluent, they tend to start to, to do more re redistributing. It seems to be uh, kind of a, almost a law of history. That That's one of the, uh, so just commerce-driven affluence is one of the, uh, the, the, the causes. <clears throat> Education, uh, an educated populace is more likely to support democracy, is more likely to <clears throat> support equality of women, uh, is more likely to, to uh, itself become more affluent in, the, in the, the next generation for the obvious reason that economies are more and more uh, knowledge driven and less and less resource dependent. Um, democracies uh, tend to be happier and healthier than autocracies, so that, that's another factor and, and more, more peaceful uh, statistically. Um, so the, I, the, there, and there are kind of positive feedback loops, uh, virtuous circles in which countries that uh, tend to get more affluent, more democratic, more educated, more uh, gender egalitarian. Uh, and we don't really know which causes which and, and which, which billiard ball hits which other billiard ball in sequence, but all of them tend to work together to give you a, a, a pretty pleasant country like Denmark versus a, a pretty miserable country like Afghanistan or, or Somalia. 
Yeah, I like uh, I like your comment on energy, the petrol dictatorship concept, where uh, you end up having these countries who have dictatorships. They have petroleum. Uh, they mine that petroleum. They try to spread that wealth out over a larger area. They end up feeding oftentimes extreme groups to try to make certain that they can stay in power. Of course, as they're exporting that product, they're also deflating their currency. And as they deflate their currency, or excuse me, inflate their currency, it makes it much more difficult for them to export product. To me, part of this, um, it relates to kind of the Viktor Frankl concept of how do you find meaning in life? The idea that we produce products means that we're keeping people busy and active and the, their creative nature comes out. Whereas in these petro dictatorships, because of what they've done, what the energy does to the, their currency, it makes it much more difficult for them to be a creative nation. I, I think a large portion of this relates to our ability to create and to innovate and to produce product, which to me tends to come back down to a focus on the individual. Uh, it, it does, and um, uh, another uh, curse of depending on resources is that whoever sits on the plot of land that has the oil or the cobalt or the diamonds uh, is um, is a winner that takes all, and that uh, it then often sets up either violent competition in, in countries with weak governments like Democratic Republic of the Congo, where warlords try to monopolize the uh, patch of ground with the valuable stuff in it. Uh, or um, uh, autocracies that whether the government commandeers the resources and they fend off any kind of uh, challenger. Uh, the uh, countries that are more commercial, the uh, Netherlands and Singapore and Hong Kong and uh, Israel and, and to a large extent all of the, the, the affluent Western nations, they don't depend just on one resource, but uh, an infrastructure of innovation and trade and commerce that can't as easily be monopolized. And sometimes there's the, the wisecrack that there's no silicon in Silicon Valley. And uh, if a country wanted to rival the, the influence and wealth of the United States, it could kind of be crazy to invade Silicon Valley because there's nothing in Silicon Valley <laughs> other than the people who are innovating, exchanging ideas, and they could be anywhere. Uh, it's so, not really the silicon. Yes. It's, not, it's, it's not about the silicon, yeah. So, so there's something in, in networks of trade and, and uh, commerce, uh, which is also why, I mean, going back to the origin of uh, the, these progressive ideas in, in the Enlightenment, it often was the commercial trading cities, the port cities, that uh, were, <clears throat> kind of, were, were hotbeds of new ideas, Amsterdam and London and uh, Boston and uh, Philadelphia, uh, where uh, people came and went, uh, uh, pamphlets and, and manifestos could be smuggled in and translated and published. People rubbed shoulders in ca coffee houses and salons and, uh, and pubs and exchanged ideas. Uh, people who were persecuted in one country could re find refuge in another. And so open cities uh, often tended to be crucibles of the, the uh, ideas that we, we now take for granted, but had to come from somewhere. Uh, and, 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 and mountainous uh, uh, kind of backwaters where everyone stayed put, it was hard to, for people to, and ideas to move, tend to be more, if we can use the word more, 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 more uh, primitive, or maybe a better word would be more uh, provincial and parochial. And it's interesting that the words themselves refer to being uh, isolated or insular, another another word that captures an idea in its literal meaning, namely if you're in an island, uh, you tend to be shut off from the, the flow of ideas. So you uh, you pointed out in your book that the, uh, the United Nations um, study that was done, or excuse me, the challenge that was done, I believe in 1992, I think it was during the time I was in office, to try to cut poverty in half, we not only met it in the 20 year time period, a time we far exceeded it. And there were a series of books that came out afterwards, uh, The Rational Optimus, other books that were kind of based upon those concepts of what was going right in the world. Not only did they receive no play, but oftentimes, uh, specifically the progressives, tend to want to ignore the progress that's come from. And I love the line that you had that for some reason progressives hate uh, to see progress. Can you talk about that and why you think maybe that is from a psychological standpoint? Well, often um, 
the, the intellectual class uh, sees itself in opposition to other elites in society, to, to the, the business people, the politicians, the uh, religious leaders, the um, military, and the intellectuals kind of stand in opposition to them. A cynical view would be that they're, that every, all the different elites kind of compete for uh, prestige and influence. And so the idea that some of the institutions, like just ordinary liberal democracy, um, uh, <coughs> commerce and exchange, deserve credit for making the world better than it could be, uh, kind of sticks in the craw of, uh, of, of uh, many intellectuals. Also, um, a lot of the things that tend to work, like networks of, of commerce, like markets, um, are, uh, are, are not... Uh, planned from the top down by theories that can be stated in terms of step-by-step -step verbal propositions. You have tens or hundreds of millions of people cooperating, and then you have Adam Smith's invisible hand that makes them all better off. But there wasn't any one person who, uh, who planned it, who decided where the resources should go. And so it's a style of uh, organization that tends just not to jibe with the way a lot of, of uh, uh, intellectuals think. Uh, I mean, the same is true for other forms of large-scale decentralized organization, like a uh, language. No one, uh, no committee ever sat down and laid out the rules of English. But nonetheless, it's a you know, pretty good way of communicating because of uh, centuries of people just trying to make their, their, their thoughts understood and, and everyone converging on a common code. Uh, so, and there's, there's a... Um, a real reluctance to, uh, on the part of many progressives, just to acknowledge that there's anything good about anything about having to do with the West. There is a uh, even though you would think that compared with some of the alternatives, like <clears throat> you know, like you know, African strongman states or Middle Eastern theocracies or uh, uh, communist autocracies, uh, would be um, anathema to to to, to progressives. Um, often there, there is there is a, a kind of a hatred of Western institutions that even drives them into the arms of, of uh, many of the uh, repugnant dictators. There's a rather sordid history of um, many intellectuals actually embracing various uh, tyrants. Um, uh, Hitler was uh, idolized by the philosopher Martin Heidegger, still uh, taught in, in, in uh, philosophy courses. Um, uh, Ho Chi Minh, Ayatollah Khomeini, Fidel Castro, uh, all of them surprisingly had supporters uh, among, among Western intellectuals, which is you know, shocking. But uh, there is something about, also about the, uh, I think, appealing about uh, some theoretician of government who implements ideas from the top down, often giving within his own society prestigious positions to intellectuals that can be quite um, uh, sad, sadly seductive. Yeah, I, I, you know, I see that on both the far right and the far left. The far right, they, they didn't, do tend to be able to identify what they'd like because they'd like a more nationalistic, fascist type state. And I'm talking about the extreme right. I'm not talking about the average Republican. Um, and on the far left, um, they tend to compare us to utopia, to, uh, to something that doesn't exist. And when you start thinking about what the real alternative is, I agree with you. I, I think they, they fail to really think about what happens when you lose the individual being at the center. Now, well, the, uh, this kind of- just add a, add a comment is that, you know, I think what you're saying is right, although I don't, I, sadly, um, I think more and more the average Republican uh, is more, um, congenial to uh, autocracy, to uh, um, uh, contemptuous of the mechanisms of democracy, um, uh, wanting to vest power in a strong leader as opposed to following the rules of uh, peaceful succession. We see this in the denial of the 2020 election results, which was uh, not even a consequence of anything that happened in the 2020 election, but was even announced beforehand that, uh, that, that uh, Donald Trump said that he would not be prepared to accept a decision that went against him. And uh, one would have, I think in the uh, earlier periods of the uh, Republican Party, this would have been um, met with, with, with shock and disdain and, and disgust. 
that there was a valorization of the American ideals of um, uh, procedure-driven, rule-governed um, uh, assignment of power rather than a uh, strong leader you know, usurping or claiming power regardless of what the results of elections uh, are. Uh, and among the intellectuals, uh, I, I've, I've noted the uh, sympathy toward uh, tyrants among many uh, uh, historical left-wing intellectuals, but now we're seeing it in, uh, very strongly in the uh, national conservative movement where right-wing intellectuals are saying, well, maybe uh, uh, top-down control by dictators isn't so bad after all. Um, so and I, I think it's a worrying trend that I, you know, I wish what you said about a typical uh, Republican was true, but it's becoming less and less true. You know, what I see, uh, I've done a lot of polling on this question, and, um, you know, I, I, you have to start with thinking about who actually belongs to the different groups and who votes. And there's no doubt, um, you know, if you, if you, you, you said that early on in the process, uh, many Republicans weren't that way. Actually, right after the election, about 85% of Republicans said, no, I thought it was a fair election through polling. Now, day by day, it was like, you know, watching, uh, I forget who it was that says it was like watching the, uh, the ship that was spouting out oil from underneath the sea. You could just sit there and watch on television these leaders who were telling us how bad it was, uh, the leader of the Republican Party telling us how bad it was, and increasingly more and more Republicans bought into it. But I, I, I believe that you also have to start with this. 44% of Americans are registered as other or independent voters. So you, you start by only talking about 30% of each side. And then when you get to people who vote in the primaries, turnout's about 30 to 35%. So you're really talking 35 by the, by the uh, 30%. You know, you're talking about 9 or 10% of the total voters on each side. And about half of them in polling that I've seen tend to be much more extreme than the general election. Now, to me, that's not a problem of of um, of believing that we have too many people that have become too authoritarian. That's a problem of the structure that we've created that gives far too much power to people who vote in those primaries as opposed to opening up elections to allowing more people to be a part of it. Yeah, um, but I agree. I agree again, with you about that. Yeah, I agree. You know, I, I, I talk to Republicans, Democrats, independents all the time, and it's very, very few of my friends tend to be extremists. Now, we'll disagree on issues, certainly. We have differing sides, but they believe in democracy and they want to see what we have continue. I think it's the extremes on both sides that see it differently. Your book on rationality, uh, what I loved about the book on rationality was, I, I see it as kind of a counter, uh, counterculture book. The Today, we're becoming much more dependent upon ideologies, um, things that aren't necessarily rational, but they, they seem to make sense because they create these loops that connect everything together. What stands in the way, in your opinion, of, of us becoming more rational? So one of them is the, our, our tribalism, what psychologists call the my side bias, namely that we tend to have certain ideas become articles of faith in, uh, in coalitions, just as religions have their canons, their dogmas, the orthodoxies, so do political factions, and people will tend to favor whatever uh, idea their, 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 uh, defines their faction. And the studies have shown that if you, if you say, here's a, a policy for improving you know, health care, and they came out of the, the, the Republican Party, the Republicans will love it, the Democrats will hate it. You take the exact same policy and you flip the story of who <laughs> proposed it and, and the support flips too. So it's, uh, we, we tend to not evaluate policy ideas on their merits, but rather on uh, which side they're associated with. So that's one, the my side, my side bias. Another is that um, people, uh, none of us is really rational enough to figure anything out on our own. Uh, I, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm a scientist and my, uh, my opinions tend to be aligned with the scientific consensus. But it's not because I say understand enough about the details of immunology and vaccines to know exactly how the bivalent um, booster works. But I kind of, you know, I, I trust my doctor. I trust the the, uh, the 
public health establishment, a public trust the medical establishment. They've been right uh, before more often than various quacks on the internet, and so I'm likely to uh, you know, do, do what they recommend. If those institutions are alienated from mainstream opinion, if people just say, well, the, why should I listen to the scientists? They're just another, uh, another tribe. I'll, uh, I'll listen to this you know, pe peddler of supplements on, uh, on, on a website. Uh, then um, that loss of credibility of institutions that deserve credibility can lead to people embracing all kinds of uh, uh, quackery and, and woo woo. Uh, so part of it is, is education. But it's not just education because people will can blow off what they or forget what they learn in school if they don't feel that they can uh, trust the the, the fact-finding establishments. And so people can believe in, in, in conspiracy theories and in uh, fake news, partly because it confirms the goodness of their side and the evil of the enemy side, uh, but also because they uh, just don't don't trust the you know, CNN or Time Magazine and the and, and Harvard University and the National Institutes of Health. And from a scientific standpoint, um, I know you're anything that you produce, you usually go through some type of peer review, meaning you're you're receiving criticism oftentimes for the work that you do. Is that correct? Certainly, that's true of papers that I publish in the um, uh, academic literature. That, uh, that that's a given. Uh, when it comes to my publishing um, books and newspaper articles, there it's not. Uh, well, then I do my own peer review. That every time I, for every chapter that I write in a book, I send it to a couple of experts and uh, solicit their feedback. Um, then I have an editor at the publishing house, and then of course I'm uh, out there to be uh, you know, vulnerable to be savaged by critics once it's uh, <laughs> once it's out there and, and published. So there's uh, many cha those channels for feedback and, and uh, review. Likewise, in publishing, say, an op-ed in a paper, there um, I will often send it out to, a, uh, or to, to, to friends, to colleagues, to, um, to my wife, who herself is a, a, a philosopher and uh, an expert in many fields. But I'll get feedback before I submit it, and then the editor certainly has a say. They'll say, no, you can't say this, uh, or, or you have to back this, that, that up. So I am. Um, uh, I don't 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 get to spout off anything that I want, but uh, it's got to pass by the eyes of uh, other people with knowledge, uh, with knowledge of the subject, and just a stake in the reputation of the institution that publishes it. So the, um, you know, the, the Penguin Random House uh, cares about the quality of books that have the Penguin Random House logo on them, and they're not going to publish a, 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 any old nonsense. Likewise, the, the, the Boston Globe or the, the New York Times or the, the uh, Financial Times, they've got their reputation to care about, and so they're not going to you know, publish any old uh, trash that just happens to be uh, you know, a clickbait, at least I do when, when, when the, those systems are working well. Uh, there's an observation about you, and I, I don't like putting labels on people, so I apologize for heading down that road a little bit. Um, but my guess is you tend to be on the left-leaning side. But my observation is that you are constantly questioning the values of the left, which I find to be fascinating. It's, it's, you, you question them in your books. You question them uh, with looking at data, which in effect means you're somewhat questioning yourself and your own thoughts. Is, is that a correct perception? Or uh, again, it seems to me like you're constantly questioning even your own ideas. Well, that, that is an aspiration, and that's what all of us should do, simply because none of, none of us is an angel. None of us has been you know, vouchsafed with the truth by the voice of God. None of us is infallible. And one of the keys of rationality is being willing to question your own beliefs, because inevitably some of them are going to be wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, I, I almost certainly don't do it as much as I should, because I am human, and uh, uh, everyone, all humans want to be right. They want to be part of the winning side. That is a bias that, you know, that I, I, I acknowledge in myself. I try to push back against. At the same time, the self looking down on the self realizes, well, you probably don't do it as much as you should, uh, just because knowing that I'm not a, you know, I'm not, I'm not a you know, su superior brain. I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm a guy, I'm a human being. And so I have to know uh, that I'm probably not discounting my own commitment to my own beliefs as much as I should. Now, someone might say, okay, well, then why don't you just back off the beliefs that are wrong? And the, the, the answer is, well, I don't 
you know, I don't know which ones are wrong. I, I, I do back off the ones that I think are wrong. There are others that I think I write, I'm right about, and I might be wrong about those for all I know. There's the, um, something called the, the, the paradox of the preface, where uh, you open a book and you read the preface that uh, I take responsibility for all the errors in this book. And you might say to the author, well, why don't you just fix the errors? And the, <laughs> And the answer is the author at that point doesn't know what the errors are, but knows that they've got to be errors because no one's infallible. So that, right. that's the situation that we're all in. And that's why we have to kind of play the game of subjecting our ideas to the scrutiny of others to, to, to have our, our uh, pieces edited, our articles peer reviewed, our books uh, open and available to, to reviews and criticism. Because uh, as much as each one of us thinks that we're right, uh, we can't all be right. Uh, at least we'll, 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 we disagree. All right. So I want to ask uh, your opinion or maybe your advice as a psychologist. Um, I don't need to sit in your chair or anything on this, but uh, um, my, here's my question, or maybe I'll do it through a metaphor. You know, the, I imagine this group of people who are on a ship, and the ship is being tossed side to side. The storm outside is fairly bad. Um, and if you went and read the manual or you looked at the engineering report, you'd recognize that this ship was going to be able to make it through hurricane type winds. You didn't have to worry about the type of storm that was there. But people on the ship start to panic. And as they start to panic, your job is to try to calm them down. And yet there's somebody over the PA system that is telling them that they should be panicked. And maybe there are even two of them, one telling them to run to the front of the ship and the other telling them to run to the back of the ship. And so panic sets in. How do you get people back to, from a psychological standpoint, when they begin to panic about where we are? And which, in my opinion, is what's happening in our country. People are panicking and they're moving to each side as opposed to looking at rational ideas and trying to figure out logically how to solve problems. From a psychological standpoint, how do you convince them of that in that type of environment? You know, I, I agree with you that, that that is a major challenge, no more, no more so than in uh, climate, where clearly the, the, uh, uh, the, the threats facing us are, are uh, real. Uh, at the same time, it doesn't mean that we're doomed. And the uh, message that we're doomed uh, leads people to a kind of paralysis or to a, a uh, kind of impotent rage just um, you know, screaming, throwing food, uh, saying, how dare you? Uh, whereas what, what we need is an awful lot of brain power applied to the problem and, um, and prioritizing it in terms of uh, policy. Uh, the, I, if we really are doomed, then you know, why bother? Just let's, let's enjoy ourselves while we can and uh, not have children and um, enjoy, the, enjoy the planet while, while we had it. Now, that can be a very destructive attitude if it means that it forecloses the commitment and the application of uh, in, ingenuity and technological uh, ideas and policy ideas that would actually mitigate the problem. So I agree. And, and what's true of climate is true of uh, other problems as well, that if we, uh, if we think that matters are hopeless, then, and this does get back to the theme of optimism, which, which we began our conversation on, uh, that it can itself be paralyzing. So optimism, even though you're right that I, uh, I, I distance myself from the label of being an, an optimist in, in presenting uh, data on positive trends in the world, I do believe there's a role in, uh, for optimism in the sense of um, uh, a constructive problem-solving attitude. Optimism, not in the sense of don't worry, things will get better, but optimism in the sense that if we treat this as a serious problem, if we apply our brain power to it, uh, in the past, we succeeded in, um, uh, in solving some uh, terrible problems of uh, people dropping like flies from, from cholera, of uh, <clears throat> world wars, of um, Kids dying from tainted milk, problem after problem. If people try to solve them, they uh, you know, they, don't, they don't make them go away completely, but they make things a lot lot better. And that's the mindset that we should apply now. It won't happen by by itself, so it's not optimism in that sense, but it is optimism in the sense that problems are are treatable. Yeah, I think we're we're stuck in a era of this 
where many people have the challenge of the amygdala hijack. Um, the, that, that fight or flight portion of our brain has overcome our ability to be rational and to think. You know, I'm, I'm optimistic, but I don't think I'm an optimist. An optimistic just simply means that, you know, you can still recognize the problems, but most of the people who are gonna solve those problems are the people who believe that we can solve those problems. Uh, and to do that, you have to be somewhat optimistic about the future and where things are headed. I also think yeah. the, the challenge is, is that as we move into our corner, we're, we're pointing the finger at the other side. I, you know, I, I, I tend to be a big supporter of equal rights, human rights, civil rights, and, and I suspect that puts me left of center on those issues. Economically, maybe I'm right of center, but, but socially, I'm, I'm left. Yet, I, you know, I look at the average Trump supporter, they're 59 years old, they're male, uh, and they have less than $2,000 in their bank account. And there's a sense that we're blaming them for all the problems that have happened in this country. And I don't know that that's fair either. And in fact, I think it's quite destructive when we try to do that. The, the goal is to reach out to them, to try to understand where they're coming from. I, you know, in watching this, I've become concerned that the authoritarianism issue isn't just on the right, that, that we're seeing a a resurgence of it in the left with things like cancel culture, uh, uh, political correctness. And, and I guess one of my questions to you is, is that, is that a real issue? Does that still exist on campus or, or are we overblowing it? No, I think it is a, it is a real issue that um, we, we do see people uh, punished, driven out of the um, uh, universities, uh, shamed, silenced, disinvited for questioning various uh, orthodoxies. And <clears throat> I think that is a concern because the um, only uh, route to knowledge, to the only way our species with all its flaws and fallacies and biases can um, bumble its way to the truth is that we express ideas, we evaluate them, we uh, um, <clears throat> see which ones are empirically confirmed, which ones are uh, logically consistent with other things that we believe in. And we try to winnow out the, the bad ones and keep the good ones. If you have it so that there are certain ideas that you can't even say, then you have disabled our uh, only route to, uh, to, to uh, understanding the world, to, to uh, approaching truth. So I think it is uh, serious. And um, it is, uh, and you're right, there is a strong streak of authoritarianism in this particular faction of, of uh, leftism that wants to use the um, uh, institutional power to shut down speech and inquiry. Polling says that even amongst younger people that there is strong support for free speech. Uh, is, is part of this being caused by people who just simply overpower them, um, overpower them by making them feel threatened in terms of their status and position? Or do you think that a majority of people who are attending colleges and universities actually have bought into the cancel culture bug? Well, there's the, it's, it's some of each. The, um, there are the, those data seem to suggest that the younger the cohort, the more receptive they are to um, preventing um, controversial ideas from being expressed. But it is not a majority. And uh, I, 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 it probably depends on the poll, depends on the question. But I think there is strong support for free speech, although it is weaker in younger cohorts than older cohorts. Kind of ironic for baby boomers who lived through the, um, the, the free speech movement of the 60s and 70s and who thought of free speech as the, the way of challenging authority and uh, overturning the, the, the repression of right-wing governments. And now the, the, uh, <clears throat> it's kind of bitter to, to see that, that the younger people also consider themselves rebellious but are uh, in favor of suppressing speech. Nonetheless, even in the younger cohorts, there is, as you say, strong support for free speech, but a lot of which gets concealed by the fact that there is enforcement, there's punishment for those who do speak out. And we know from social dynamics that when there is punishment of uh, uh, unpopular ideas, that you can have a situation in which many people privately believe something while mistakenly believe that they're mistakenly believing that they're the only ones who believe it. That is it's sometimes called pluralistic ignorance, where um, everyone believes something, or most people believe something, but uh, falsely think that, that uh, no one else does. 
because anyone who's because they're not the ones speaking up. Right. So the so the question I would have, um, and again I'm a long ways away from university politics, but. Uh, and, and not in all cases. I think in some cases, administrators are doing a great job. But my sense is part of the problem here is our administrations. Administration's not standing up for the college professors. Administration's not standing up for the right of freedom of speech and instead giving in to the small minority group of students. Is that, it, it, do you see that as being a challenge or is that just off base? No, I think, I think that's absolutely right. That the, uh... The, the responsible grown-ups have abdicated their responsibility to um, uh, to, to uh, implement standards of uh, open inquiry and free speech. It's often the administrators who are the, are the cancelers, not just because they're responding to pressure from students, but many of them the, themselves are um, uh, kind of carried some of the worst ideas of the 60s and 70s that, uh, that speech is a form of violence, that uh, repression of speech is justified for the greater good of, uh, of uh, implementing a more um, uh, you know, socialist society. Uh, and it's often the <clears throat> baby boomer administrators who are aiding and abetting and sometimes leading the, the atmosphere of, of uh, repression. So I think that we do need uh, also, increasingly, university leaders are kind of custodians of big corporate enterprises where their main goal is just to keep things quiet, don't invite trouble, keep the donations coming, keep the university out of the news. And so they often will take the most expedient path towards just quietening everything down rather than uh, standing up for some principle that might, might uh, make them unpop unpopular. You know, when I was uh, mayor, we had a, a rally that was going to be held by the Ku Klux Klan, which I immediately said as mayor, no chance. Am I going to let them do this? My chief of staff, a guy named Barry Starr, who was very active in the Jewish community, he, was, uh, he came to me and he said, hey, don't do this. He said, not only don't stop them from marching, send out police protection to make certain they're protected. Make certain you're respectful of them. And I, you know, I said, Barry, with what's happened to you in your life and your family, how can you support that? He said, if you try to suppress them, you're going to make it worse. Right? Mm -hmm. We let the rally happen and eight people showed up and <laughs> you know, we had <laughs> police protection around them. It, it didn't matter. I find that what the cancel culture ends up doing oftentimes, first, they harm themselves on the very issue they're trying to promote because by suppressing the other side, you drive more people into that camp. People don't just become invisible. They, 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 when they become suppressed, they see, they become angry, and it, and it drives them towards more extreme actions. But it also has an effect on the student by not making them better, not making them more resilient, not being able to let them think about complex ideas. And, you know, I, to me, the idea that you hear from the left and right is important because it tends to drive people towards rationalism, to understanding, okay, how do we get to an answer here that works for more people, but that also takes into account the real purpose of what we're trying to get to? Well, I, I, I agree with all of that. And of course, there was the famous case with the American Civil Liberties Union um, legally supported the right of Nazis to, to, to march in Skokie, Illinois, a place that actually had a lot of Holocaust survivors. Um, you know, the, the ACLU uh, absolutely despised the, the, the Nazis, to put it mildly, but they uh, stood up for the, the, the right of freedom of assembly and freedom of speech in a democracy. It's not so clear the ACLU would do that today, but uh, in fact, they probably wouldn't. But, uh, mm -hmm. but there, there is still the principle. But it's, and I think it's important, though, to uh, also acknowledge that the, that the point of protecting free speech isn't just as a matter of principle that I, I may disagree with you, but I'll defend your right to, to say it, but uh, when it, and especially when it comes to uh, extremism like the, the, like the Klan. Um, but often the ideas that are being repressed now might turn out to be correct, and we can't tell unless we evaluate it. They may not be crazy ideas. So an example is the idea that the um, SARS-CoV-2 virus, the cause of the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, originated in the leak of, um, of uh, experimentally manipulated pathogens from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Uh, that was for a while repressed because it was you know, anti-Asian racism and uh, 
turns out that you know there is some chance that it's true. I don't think it's true, but the, 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 our understand, best understanding now says that it's, it's something that should be investigated, something that we should um, uh, get to the truth of because it may be instrumental in preventing the next pandemic. If you can't say that, uh, if you, you can't even raise the question or, or rule it out, then it means you are guaranteed to be ignorant about issues that can be highly consequential. Um, and so it's not just that um, you know, crazy and dangerous ideas like the, 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 the Klan um, ha have a right to be expressed, but a lot of the ideas that have a right to be expressed are, are quite plausible and might turn out to be true. Uh, now, of course, there are lines, and even, even a free speech um, advocate such as myself and, and the, and the um, staunchest free speech defenders um, that I know, including uh, former ACLU members, acknowledge that there are uh, uh, limits to, 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 to speech, such as uh, immediate incitement to violence, like uh, libel, like hardcore por pornography, like um, extortion, like bribery, crimes that by their very nature involve speech by, by their definition. You can't uh, uh, extort someone unless you're saying something to them. And we, there's very good reason that extortion should be a crime. So there are limits. No one is a free speech absolutist. There's no one who thinks about the issues of free speech absolutist for everything. But still, these are tightly circumscribed exceptions that are justified for particular reasons. It's not just, oh, you can't say that because it hurts me or I'm offended by it. Yeah, collectivist delusions, um, certainly they exist. The, the whole challenge that we have with conspiracy theories that can be delusional and that in themselves can be damaging or problematic. However, silencing them generally doesn't help the problem. In my opinion, those extreme positions are best when they're fed it out, when, when, when they go into the free marketplace of ideas and one person can talk about what's happening and then someone else can challenge that set of ideas. People can recognize for themselves what's extreme and what's not. But the minute you stop having the two sides talk to one another and engage in debate and engage in discussion, it becomes much easier in my mind for the collectivist delusion to prosper. Yeah, no, I think that, I think that that's right, or the authoritarian delusion. That's right. So, all right. Um, so I want to go back to rationality just for a moment. Now, I, I remember uh, one of the first books that you read, wrote, well, one of the first books that you wrote that I read, how about that, was Blank Slate. That took me back to a couple of your other books on linguistics and other items. But in Blank Slate, um, it was it was a pretty controversial idea at the time. And, and my question, I'd, I'd love to talk about Blank Slate, but it's really more about you for a moment. I'm not altogether sure that it's rational for you to put yourself out into position sometimes that could cost you tenure or cost you your job or put you into a position where people wanted to cancel you out or where you be, would become toxic. What is it about your nature that gives you the ability to do that, the ability to test norms that, that you had to know when you were doing it could be very challenging to you in your career long term? Well, I've got to say that certainly the, the protection of tenure made a difference. And even though um, you know, there, there's reason to wonder if tenure is the best means of protecting um, freedom of speech in, within academia, uh, I can certainly say in my case, it made a huge difference. If there was no such thing as tenure, I would have been much more trepidatious about uh, writing some of the things that, that I wrote. Um, also, I don't, uh, you know, I, I don't, uh, I don't express um, every opinion that I have. Uh, I don't have opinions on every issue. So, uh, and I don't um, say things to provoke, to be outrageous, to, uh, to, to, to rile people up. The, the arguments that I make, I think I can back up. I do, I try to back them up. And so uh, anyone who wants to, um, you know, attack me for them has to face, you know, face the arguments, and, uh, and I, I try not to do it just as a, a, a means of being uh, provocative or outrageous. That's uh, I, don't, I don't know as much about value in that. Um, I also uh, tend to express opinions where I'm not just the only person. Where there's uh, a uh, you know, I've got a, a kind of a posse or a, a, a network of fellow. Um, Academics, scientists, and journalists who also have expressed that opinion. So I'm just not not, not some maverick who's who's uh, out there. It may be a minority, um, but uh, but it's never just me. Did you receive pressure on that book, Blank Slate? 
Yes. Oh no, there was a lot of. Uh, I mean, there, well, there was, as I expected, it was a mixed mixed response. I got uh, I, the, the book uh, won a number of prizes. It was a, a finalist for the Pulitzer. It, um, it was on a number of uh, end of year best books lists. Um, it uh, my my career didn't suffer. I was I wrote it when I was at MIT, and then I got a job offer from uh, from, from from Harvard, so I moved across town. Um, but it also got some some you know fairly, fairly vicious attacks in some mainstream places. Uh, did not result in any you know, demonstrations or people throwing things at me or uh, any, any of the, or any or cancellation. Um, so it did not result in, in any kind of dire career consequences. Now, my friend Larry Summer said it didn't get you almost fired, but it almost got him fired or well, something along that line. <laughs> well, there is, yes, there, there was that, yes. But uh, I was not uh, a, uh, I, I was not a, a university president, and so there was, uh, I had a little more freedom of speech than he had. Yeah. Well, uh, Professor Pinker, thank you so much for coming on. We very much appreciate you being a part of our show today. Um, I can't wait for your next book. They're always fun to read and, uh, uh, they definitely reach out on the edge. But thank you again for being here today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining the Optimistic American Show. Now help us grow by subscribing to our channel. If you enjoyed the episode, please leave a like and a comment. There is so much more that we have planned. We can't wait for you to embark upon this journey with us.